Best Book Bits podcast brings you Timber Hawkeye, the best-selling author of Buddhist Boot Camp. His books and Buddhist Boot Camp podcast offer an approach to being at peace with the world, both within and around us, with the intention of to awaken, enlighten, enrich, and inspire. Timber is also a podcast producer, a publisher, and an international public speaker. Timber, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for the platform and introducing readers to such wonderful books. I really admire what you do. No worries. Thank you very much. Take us back to your early years. Where did you grow up and what was your teenage years like? Uh, Born and raised in a small town in Israel. And my parents decided to up and move uh, from there to San Francisco uh, my first year of high school. And I didn't speak a word of English. None of us did. And it was a huge culture shock going from a small town Uh, in the Golan Heights to, you know, the Bay Area in California, where my high school had 3,000 students in it, which was more people than my the town I grew up in had. And I had never seen anyone who didn't, you know, for lack of a better way to explain it, didn't look like me. And suddenly, you know, out of the 3,000 students from my school, only six of us uh, were can pass for white. And so I was introduced to all these different cultures and religions and beliefs and backgrounds. And it really kickstarted my lifelong journey of understanding just different, different viewpoints in the world, never from the standpoint point of, you know, I have the answers, but tell me more about what, how you were raised. I just, the curiosity has led my journey ever since. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an incredible journey that where my, parents really wanted me to stick to my own and I did the exact opposite of just exploring looking under every rock so to speak well after that you talk about talk to us about finding traditional success love and happiness by working in corporate America for over a decade then marrying then divorcing young what was that experience like and what did you learn yeah I I mean that was that was part of moving to the states and being determined to being the all-american kid whatever that looked like and at the time this was the early 90s, it was definitely, you know, go to school, then go to college, get a job, make good money, you know, get married, like buy the, buy the house, like it was just like, success by the way it is determined by outside forces, just really validating that, oh, you have a sports car, oh, you have a condo, oh, you, you're working at a prestigious law firm, okay, then you're successful. And yet, the, I wasn't happy. It, like, I, I was, I was just, I was on that path, but it didn't feel like my path, if that makes sense. And so one day while uh, another paralegal at the same law firm where I was working was celebrating her 30 year anniversary at the firm, and mind you, it's been 10 years for me, I I looked at her and, I, and I, in a way saw my own future. I saw where my journey was gonna lead me if I didn't get off that treadmill right there and then. So I sold everything I ever owned. I got rid of the condo, the sports car, you name it. And I moved to Hawaii with initially the intention to just lead a simple and uncomplicated life. I chose Hawaii because I could live there without a car. I was a beach volleyball player. And in Hawaii, you could play that every day all year round because the weather is very accommodating. And I didn't need much. I I figured that that would be a really good place for me to work less and live more. So my invitation through all my writing and the podcast is not for everyone to sell everything they own and move to Hawaii, but to, to look at their lives and figure out, you know, am I on my own path or am I on someone else's path that they have laid out for me? In fact, uh, Stephen Batchelor, one of my favorite authors, uh, explains that the the word we com- often use, the path, as a an area through the woods from which all obstacles have been removed. And when you're in the forest and you see it, you're like, oh, that's the path. The trouble is, if it's an area from which all obstacles have been removed, that means someone was there before you and they have cleared a path. And if you take that path, it will take you to where they went, but it may not be where you want to go. And that's, again, what I realized is I was on someone else's path. I was living someone else's life And I didn't know what my life was going to look like until I stopped doing that. So I didn't know what I wanted to do in Hawaii, but I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to replicate the same working in a cubicle under fluorescent lights to accumulate stuff, you know, and and that's 
Also, you know, if you've ever watched Fight Club, which I don't necessarily recommend people watch because it's an extremely violent graphic movie, but it depicts the internal struggle in all of us. And he was saying, you know, how we, we work jobs we hate so we can buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't like. And I didn't want that to be me. So that's where the journey kind of started of self-exploration and then where that led me. So I was just going to expand on that. So in the book, you talk about living in a condo with designer clothes and a sports car. You looked at your imported Italian furniture one day and realized Tyler Durden was right when he said, the things you own end up owning you. And it's not until you lose everything that you're free to do anything so you quit your job, you sold everything, and you moved to Hawaii. So yeah, that was. I like the Fight Club analogy through there as well. But yeah, being in Hawaii, playing uh, playing beach volleyball, but you had the sort of intention and time to study world religions and psychology. Talk to me about those sort of early days, you know, learning and and being yourself. It's education is not what happens when you finish school. Education is what happens after school. When it's self education is the real education. So. Talk to us about those experiences of deep diving into world religions and psychology. What did you unpack and, and discover? Yeah, suddenly I had a lot of uh, time on my hands, especially at one, one year when I decided to actually stop playing volleyball. And I remember my dad asking me, but why quit volleyball? I get why you quit the job. I get what you quit all of that. But this is something you're really good at and it's something you enjoy. And why not? And I said, well, there's nothing inherently harmful or wrong with volleyball but what would i be doing with my time if i wasn't doing that you know what i mean like if i was to if that wasn't taking up a big chunk of my time what would similar to the early 90s where i unplugged from the tv you know i was so accustomed to coming home and watching tv and one day i just got rid of the tv and i didn't know what was going to take up my time until i did that and when i quit volleyball that's when i really dove into and i had time to study both you know world religions and psychology to understand what people believe and why we believe what we do. I mean, that's the juicy part. And not, not just religion, but even your prejudices. Where did you pick them up? And more importantly, why are you still carrying them? So I started, I mean, the, the short version is I started with the Tibetan Lama, uh, who my teachers at the time referred me to. And after being in that monastery or temple, it was a lay practitioner's temple for a while, I... I, I said to him, as I explained in the introduction of the book, that what drew me to Buddhism is, is the Buddha's sim teaching on simplicity. It's very simple. It's very clear. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. What, what makes us suffer, the reason we suffer is because pain plus resistance equals suffering. So the pain of growing old, getting sick, dying, all of that is inevitable. And th that pain is, is something we all experience. But if we resist growing old, getting sick, dying, it's the resistance to what's happening. That's what creates suffering within us. So I wanted to explore how can we, how can we let go, so to speak, of the resistance? How can we loosen our grip and allow whatever needs to unfold to unfold and, and decide how are we going to show up for life? And yet, when, when I looked around at the Tibetan depiction of the Buddha's teachings, it did not resonate with me. And, and I'm really grateful that Lama Renchen was, was so warm-hearted and, and understanding when I told him, with all due respect, I don't believe the Buddha's teachings in, you know, were ever intended to become this complicated. And he just laughed and he said, well, the Buddha didn't do this. Tibetan culture did. And if you want a simpler take on it, then try Zen. Because what happened with the Buddha's teachings is that every time it entered another culture, it was spiced with its, you know, the, the local flavor, so to speak. And so when it got to Korea, when it got to Japan, when it got to J Thailand, and he said, I would really like Zen because it's very clean, very simple and true to form. I didn't just get a book on Zen Buddhism. I left that temple and I moved into a Zen monastery completely off the grid. That really helped me dive deep into the practices of what we now call mindfulness, which is introducing a pause between impulse and response because i wasn't born into monkhood and all of a sudden i took the monastic vows here i am in full robes trying to live a very mindful life but but i wasn't born into it so there's this deep groove of a pattern that i've repeated for years of pattern of thoughts patterns of behavior and now all of a sudden i'm trying to change direction so to speak not just 
in my way of life, but in my way of thinking. And mindfulness is that pause between impulse of like, oh, this is what I'm going to do, pausing and then saying, how do I change the narrative? How do I rewrite who I am? And we do that by how we respond instead of react to what's happening in front of us and what's happening within us. So I was in this really wonderful, uh, almost like a slow cooker surrounded by teachers and teachable moments and the opportunity to really look deep within. But I don't think we all need to, you know, sell everything we own and move to Hawaii and we don't all need to unplug and move into a monastery off the grid. I truly believe we can all introduce a gap between impulse and response. And so that's what a friend once wrote me a letter and she said, you know, um, I, I get that you like being at the monastery, but you took a vow to be selfless. And I hate to tell you this, you being at the monastery is the most selfish thing you can do because how are you being of service to anyone if you're tucked away in the mountains somewhere? And she was absolutely right. And, and even at the monastery, they tell you the goal is not for this to become your home. It's for you to learn what you need to learn and then go back out there and live it. And I thought, well, I can be peaceful in the monastery. Can I do that in downtown LA? <laughs> so that's what I did. I tried to put it into practice. Uh, I moved, I did it gradually. I moved into another lay practitioner's temple. And then the same friend who had told me that told me, you know, when you, gosh, it was probably eight years prior, uh, when you first sold everything and moved to Hawaii, you started sending me a letter every month to let you, me know what you're learning, what's going on with you. And I really think you need to publish those letters. And I'm like, what, why would anyone want to read that? And she goes, that's not for you to decide. You just publish them. I think people will benefit from it. And almost as a dare, I, I took her up on it and I published those journal entries and those letters. And that's what started this realization that there's so much hunger out there from people to figure out how to do this in the real world, not just in the monastery in the, in the mountains somewhere, but in everyday life. How do we incorporate this slowing down and not necessarily letting go, you know, because if someone is, is living their life white knuckled, clinging to everything and you tell them to let go, letting go is too far removed from where they are. So the invitation is really to loosen our grip. That's the first step. And then, it, and then that becomes like your shoulders, you know, drop. Everything just becomes much, uh, I don't want to say easier but perhaps manageable. We, 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 we learn tools with which to navigate through life. It's the difference between trying to get a screw out with a screwdriver and trying to do it with a butter knife. They both kind of work, but when you have the right tool for it, it, it's just, it fits so much better. You feel more aligned with even the challenges of life, if that makes sense. I'm sorry, I went on, on a tangent there, but it's, it's just one, you pull one thread and the whole thing just starts to blossom. It's wonderful. I want to circle back. Yeah, thank you for unpacking that. Yeah, it's a it's great how the I was going to ask how did the first book come about, but I understand the book came about through blog to book and yeah about your notes through there. And I like how you said, you know, it's not you decide the information. It's about you know the the people who read it in the marketplace too. But circling back to and, and you bet me to it because I was going to ask you uh, the funny story about when you went to the Buddhist monastery sitting in front of the Tibetan Lama and you said with all due respect I don't believe the Buddha ever intended for his teacher to get this complicated then he looked at you and laughed and basically said you know all these statues and deities and multiple arms he chuckled and said the Buddha didn't do to the Tibetan culture did so I like how you were very self-aware that there's a difference between the religious information or the religious icons and the culture and what they do and we can look at this even with you know christianity and how in ireland in greece in italy in different countries they practice different um the, the culture is interwoven into the teaching and sometimes it gets so confusing for um, a foreigner to look at it and go you know what this is just so confusing i never would have thought that the buddha did this or christ did this or you know it's even look i was watching a documentary the other day about uh, islam and how you know they have to go to um saudi arabia and i'm going to confuse this but there's so many rituals and so many so much baggage that goes with it and so much process and so much systems and it's takes away from the essence of what the original message is and i like how you were self-aware that don't confuse the message with the 
the structure of it, the the institution, the organization of it. Is there anything you want to expand on that? Yeah, I do too. My altar has Buddha, Jesus, and St. Francis, Tyler Durr, and they get along just fine. It's it's not about being Christian. It's not about being Buddhist. It's about being Christ-like or Buddha-like, which is why my second book was called Faithfully Religionless, is because it's not about I mean, I called Buddhist boot camp that because it, it that's what my life felt like at the time. Like I was in a Buddhist like boot camp, like here you are in the deep end. But it's not about becoming a Buddhist, just like it's not about embracing the, the Tibetan culture necessarily, just because that was the first taste I got. And yes, I will equate that to a real life experience. When I moved from San Francisco to Seattle, for example, I looked at my life and I realized that in San Francisco, all my friends... I had met one and then I said, hey, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, a bunch of us are going here. And so I started doing what my friends like to do. And that became my life. Every Friday, we would call up our buddy Steve and go, hey, where are we hanging out this weekend? And he would tell everyone and we all went there and we all tried whatever. But when I moved to Seattle, I didn't know anyone. And I realized I have an opportunity here to either meet someone and repeat that same cycle of, oh, what do you like to do? And then go do that or pause and figure out what do I like to do? Like, where's timber in all of this? And I was like, well, I really like to hike. So I went on hiking trails alone at first, but guess who I met on hiking trails? Other people who like hiking. So it was just kind of like, instead of finding something and sticking to it, finding myself and elaborating on it. So it it happened with preferences, with, with choices, but it also happened with figuring out, is there a religion that's right for me, so to speak, or, does every religion, every school of thought, every philosophy offer something of value that I can incorporate into my life? And I believe every philosophy offers plenty that can resonate with us and we can take what works and let go of the rest. And it's so enriching. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's a very flavorful life with so much insight from so many teachers because there's a song by Ani DeFranco where she goes, you can find poetry written on a bathroom wall, you know? So it, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. So can we just separate the two and focus on the message rather than hold the messenger up? Which is another thing I really liked about the Buddha. It, it, he's not a God. He's not the son of God. He doesn't pretend to be a God. He's a regular guy like you and I, who at one point went, wait a minute, what I've been taught, what I've been told by my parents, teachers, etc." This is, this doesn't feel right for me. It may be right for them, but it doesn't resonate with me. And he sought to find his own truth. And that's the invitation. There's not a single should statement in the book. I'm not telling people what to think. I'm encouraging people to think sometimes for the first time for themselves. And that is a, a, a true incredible gift that keeps enriching my own life. It well said. And it, the thing is, right, there's so many, there's billions of people around the world that that follow teachings of people that were around thousands of years ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but there's so, there's th hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of teachers in recent years. And some of my early mentors and teachers was the likes of Osho, Ramdas, Terence McKenna, and Eckhart Tolle. And all of those four people that have in common, they talk about their own people they looked up to in recent years that they learned from as well. And the information and the message just snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. And yourself, you could you could write a whole long list of the the influences that you've had to where your message is. And as you know, the more you get into spirituality, Zen, Buddhism, all that, the more you become empty. And then you're basically just clearing out your vessel and you just become an empty shell. Not so much you're filling your head with stuff, you're taking things out. And you're going back, circling back to what you said earlier, the early days for yourself was about letting go of all the things that that you held on to as well and i think that's step number one of any zen or buddhist practice is to understand that you know don't take life too serious let go of the grip you know take away the i and the you and the, and the should um which is which is really cool so yeah anyway i just want to unpack that there's so many teachers that people can learn off if they just explore and they realize that there's so many uh current uh, teachers and information out there that you'd be, you'd be mind blown. Fast forward to your second book, you, you wrote a memoir called Faithfully Religionless. Religionless, yes. I know, it's a tongue twister. Yeah, it's a tongue twister because I have a tremendous amount of faith, but it's not ascribed to any one religion. Uh, after I, I published the first book, I didn't think there was going to be a second, but I went on a book tour across the US, UK, and Australia for three years. And 
And when I finished that, I realized, you know, everywhere I went, many people had very similar questions. They're like, we love Buddhist boot camp. We love the stories. We love what you've done with your life. But how did you get there? Like, what what's the journey like? And, and, and so that's what the second book is. It's like, here it is. If we were to go on a hike together and I were to tell you my life story, that would be it. And it's it's very interesting because it attracted a very different audience. And yet there's so much hunger for more to you know, as you say, you let go, you let go of labels. You're like, you know, because people have been asking me, are you Buddhist? I'm like, I'm a lot of things. Like not one of them defines me. The moment you put me on that label on me, then that means I'm not anything else, but I'm all of them. And the, the beauty of all that letting go of that, all that stripping of the, the teacher and the teachings and, and realizing, you know, none of it is my own. There's nothing in the books we don't already know. They are reminders of what we have somehow forgotten. And so in, as far as what what's most important to let go of in in Buddhist boot camp and and in faithfully I always say that the opposite of what you know is also true to somebody else somewhere else because of their time place and circumstance and so if we can make peace with that that someone else's truth is just as true and real and valid to them as our truth is to us if we can make peace with that everything else becomes easier so I kind of start out at the deep end like make peace with that and people go, yeah, but, yeah, but. And it's like, you can argue with yourself all day long. The idea is one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, you know, and, and just find your truth and realize even your own truth was somehow different five years ago, 10 years ago, which means it'll be a little different 10 years from now. And so just, again, it's not about, I mean, it is about not taking yourself too seriously, but not putting a capital T on your truth, putting a small T on it and just leaving room for, staying teachable you know I, I, my favorite quote is trust those who seek for the truth be leery of those who claim to have found it so remain teachable if you identify as a student everything and everyone will become a teacher the moment you think you have the answers you're off the path yeah absolutely yeah the best teachers are the ones that are still students and you know it's having that not necessarily growth mindset versus fixed mindset but being open to drop information and so you know what, that, that doesn't actually resonate anymore. But it's also about being in tune to what you think is true. So a small example is, it's listen to your own, you know, use your own eyes as discernment, own ears, you know, use your own intuition and your own faculties as well, instead of being so heavily in the mind, but use your heart as well, what feels good. You know, we can, you can't intellectualize love. You can only feel it or passion or truth. It's something that you feel, not something that that you know. So it's just getting in touch and in tune with yourself as well. You talk about in the book, it's about letting go of the need to know. Talk about the importance of why we need to drop the idea that we need to know what's going to happen or how it's going to unfold or, or what do you mean by that? Drop because we want answers. We, we keep digging and digging and like, what's the truth? What's the ultimate truth? What's What do I need to know? And it's like, you know, if someone comes to me and they tell me the sky is purple and I believe it to be blue, I don't need to argue with them. I don't need to prove to them that they are wrong. I don't need to make myself superior by making them inferior. I just say, tell me more. I want to, you know, tell me more about your purple sky. And I can walk away from that conversation knowing that to some people, the sky looks purple. You know, so I've grown from this experience and it, I'm not threatened by that because the, the blueness of my sky is not jeopardized by how purple someone else perceives it to be. So the more confident I am with my truth, with my reality, like you said, what resonates well, is the less I need to argue with others. And so I'm just more open to hearing other people's story rather than trying to prove myself somehow better than them. Like I have the answers and they're still searching. The, the superiority complex has never, ever, ever resonated with me of thinking that I'm here and you're down there. It's like, we're all trying to figure this out. I mean, just like you said with Ram Dass, we're all walking each other home. And if we just if, if we open our minds up to understanding, then we open our hearts up for compassion. And it's not just trusting. You said love cannot be conceptualized. And, and the first thing that jumped to mind is, is for how many thousands of, if not more years, people have tried to, to explain what love is. And I truly believe the Dalai Lama figured it out. He says in, in the shortest sentence possible, love is the absence of judgment. And and the more I sat with that, I still do, the more I realized that is, it's so true because the moment there is judgment, the love goes away. 
And when there isn't, when it's truly unconditional, that's love. Everything else becomes almost transactional. And it's, we're all capable of this, but we have to drop this notion, this letting go of the need to know, this notion that we are right and someone else is wrong. We're not at, at war with one another. We are, we are in, the, on the, in the same boat with everyone. And it's just such a, it, it, there's so much camaraderie at that point with everyone, even with people you disagree with. It's just, you just see them as siblings, not as, as rival. I know it's, it's, I can go on and on about how enriching it is to stop struggling uh, not because life stops being challenging, but because you have these tools with which to get over them now, if that makes sense. Yeah, one of the quotes I really love and yeah, well said is the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. And I feel we carry this a lot of pain because we're not we're withholding love. And it's just the circumstances we're adding off and some of the scripts and loops that we play on that we, we, we go through days where we don't experience love, but we don't show love is because we're just, we're just, we're just hiding it or, or there's so much pain in front of it. But one of the questions I've got from you as well is what are the, some of the final steps, not, not the first steps, but the final steps to leading a, a life of purpose, congruence and conviction, or, or what are some of the steps you've seen for people that got the end of that stage, the final steps? not the first steps of really embracing their purpose, congruence and conviction and, and life purpose. I, I hate to burst your question, but the, the first steps and the final steps are identical. Meaning Gandhi said that happiness, which is what we're all trying to achieve here, is when your thoughts, your words and your actions are all in harmony. So the first step is to explore, look within. What, what are, in, in the sense that how can your uh, life, how can you live your life in line with your values if you're not clear on what your values are? So perhaps the first step is to figure out what are my core values? And then you figure out, well, am I living in line with those values? Because the moment we're not, the moment that we say one thing and do another or believe one thing but live another, is we, we're creating an internal conflict. And then we can't live at peace with ourselves or anyone else because there's conflict within us. So the first step is it's not, there's not even first and step. It's not a ladder. It's, it's continuous of always taking inventory and figuring out what are my values? Am I living in line with them? Because the moment I'm not, I'm creating conflict within me. And then I, I'm living in conflict with myself and others. So you want to call them the first steps or the final steps. It doesn't matter. It's always to live a congruent life, to not, not allow cognitive dissonance to, to somehow shift and allow and, and make room for you to live in, in a way that's not aligned with your own truth. And, and, and again, not someone else's, but it has to be your own. It has to reconcile like a checkbook at the end of the day, or you are out of balance. I mean, for, for, for lack of a better metaphor. So call it first, middle or end of the path. I think it's, it's circular, it's constant and requires, you know, it, it, when people say they're trying to find peace, I'm like, it's not lost. It's not something you're going to find one day and then, oof, boom, that's it. You're going to forever have it. Peace and, and love and balance, they're not things that are lost. They're things that we continually create. We, we have a responsibility. And, and I love that word because I break it down. Response ability, the ability to choose our response to the world around us. We cannot control what other people are doing, but we can control how we respond. And if we respond with anger, then we are angry. If we respond with animosity, then we're, we're violent and, and hostile. But if we, we're, if we want to be peaceful, we need to respond from a peaceful place. So again, I hate to, to burst that question as, as, you know, of that linear. No, no, no I've, I've un I, I want to unpack it a little bit more because I think I, I, I agree with you and disagree with you at the same time, but I just agree with you in the fact of, I think it's a wheel. So what you said there when Gandhi said, making sure that your thoughts, words, and actions uh, are aligned, and that's that's the key to happiness. So if you think about a wheel, okay? So at the top, you've got thoughts. So it all starts from a thought. So you make sure that your thoughts uh, are what, you're, what you value on first. And then thoughts create your words, and you start speaking your your thoughts into existence through words. Make, and then through words, create your actions, which is down the bottom of the wheel. And then through action creates habits and through habits create thoughts again. So the more you're living the wheel of life with your values, your thinking, your thoughts are in line with your values, your words are in line with your values, your actions are in line with your values and your habits, which is your lifestyle, your day-to-day, -day, 
is in line with your habits, then that that's obviously the key to, you know, living back to my question, leading a life of purpose, congruence and conviction. So thank you for helping me unpack that. I just needed it's a wheel, it just goes it No, because it keeps going around. Correct, yeah. Like it doesn't matter what anyone throws at you or does to you, your lifestyle is pretty much going to continue in terms of your your mental habituation is you know like what what is your routine let me it's i'm laughing because it's it's very fluid uh you know taking the monastic vows to be of service uh means you're you're letting go of of your own quote unquote preferences and you're figuring out how can i show up and so you know some days i'm i'm being interviewed for a podcast other days i'm speaking in front of people other days i'm just at home reading you know it's most days i'm out hiking in nature <laughs> it's finding and again remaining teachable so that no matter what i do i i look at it as a learning opportunity a growth opportunity and and a way to to translate it because i don't think what i'm doing is teaching anyone anything i'm taking ancient teachings and translating them to a language that people today can understand so it's not about even anyone leading, leading my life and doing what I do and then you get up where I am. It's not, again, that, that path through the forest. That was my path. You know, don't, don't get on mine. Find your own. And if there's an obstacle in your way, it's not in your way. That is your way. Learning how to overcome that obstacle is the lesson you need to figure out in this moment. And trying to bypass it, as Pema Jodron says, a lesson will keep repeating itself until you learn it. And so resistance is futile just deal with it as it comes and so that's how i lead my day um i i very much stay true to the teachings um in both books meaning it would be the the, the message in the books would lose their integrity if there i was talking about living a simple and uncomplicated life and yet i was running around like a chicken with its head cut off busy as can be so there's a lot of downtime there's a lot of um, allowing and again the pandemic changed everything prior to that i did travel for two weeks out of every month um, speaking at schools and prisons and now um, with the restrictions being lifted it's all picking up again there's actually going to be a third book which is a collection of the podcast episodes the format will be very similar to the first one where each one is only a page long and you can read them in any order so that's what does my day look like unpacking uh thoughts beliefs uh, situations uh, relationships I do a lot of one-on-ones with people that really helps, you know, how to, because people really appreciate the message and go, but how do I apply this into my life? And so my job, so to speak, is to hold up a mirror and go, look what you're doing. I mean, you just got done telling me what everyone else is doing to you, but it's like, how are you part of that equation? Not, not to victim blame, but to empower people to say, I can change this situation. I can't change other people, but I can change how I show up for it. And that is, is an ongoing, whether you know, travel restrictions are lifted completely or not, this will continue. Uh, and, and we have monthly discussion groups. And so this is this is my life is what we're, you and I are doing right now. These are conversations around the dinner table. And these are conversations, you know, with corporations and, and universities. It's it doesn't change. My life is pretty much the same. I show up the same to everything. I, I hate that if that sounds boring, but you know, that's 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 it is to show up even on a hiking trail and go what what am i here to learn today the one thing i learned early on studying you know personal development success and all that kind of stuff is that your goals is someone else's lifestyle and if you look at someone unquote successful look at their lifestyle and their lifestyle is not just what they have but what they think as i said the wheel what they think what are they talking about what are their actions and what are their habits so once you get everything you just look at someone's lifestyle and it's like what is he doing what is he thinking what does he believe you know like it's just a it's just a lifestyle so there's not it's not an end point it's it's a wheel yeah even if your your goal is to be healthy you know look at what you're eating you know i i you know are your decisions going to get you there or is it just an idea just a theory and so my job the boot camp part of it is to nudge people out of that this thinking ideally you know or thinking oh i want to be successful by the traditional sense i want to have the big house and i want to have the jet ski and all that i'm like yeah but that comes with you know a, a career of 30 years of working 80 hours a week and ulcers and headaches do you want all of that too because it's a complete package you know and deciding do i really want that because i need validation from outside from other people to look at me and and label me as successful or can i be at peace with without any of that and i truly believe we can 
we're just so concerned with what other people think about us. And that's, yeah, so lots of therapy, lots of um, self-reflection and redefining every word we've been taught, even success. Forget what, what you've been told. I, re I remember seeing the coffee mug at my old attorney's office and he it just said success means being happy. And it just blew my mind because up until that point, success was like a checklist. Like you said, just like just check boxes of a, I need the house, I need the car, I need all this, this stuff. And ultimately, it's like if none of that stuff makes you happy, that you're not going to get to happiness. You're just going to get to hoarding a whole bunch of stuff that that now weighs you down, making happiness farther away rather than closer, if that makes sense. Yeah, they throw it into the future. I'll be happy when dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Happiness. A lot of people put happiness on the shelf and think once I get everything, I'll just pick it off the shelf. Amen. Yeah. Where, you know, the other things can wait, but if you've got happiness now, you're the most successful person in the world. Uh, there's so many things in the book you talk about, but a couple of things I want you to um, unpack is the idea of grasping and the idea of sort of training the mind and stop granting yourself everything that you crave and let your mind know who's boss and talk about how the sometimes the mind is like a little sport rich kid that throws tantrums. I like that one. Yeah, there's that or comparing it to a puppy. When you, when you take a puppy for a walk the first time, the puppy just sniffs around and he wants to chase after everything that sparks his curiosity. And with time, you can train your puppy to stay by your side and walk next to you. When you get to the dog park, you can take the leash off and let it run. And that's great. It's just like with your mind, you can train it to just stay focused on what you want it to focus on and then sometimes just let it run wild and explore. The key is, can you call the mind? Can you call the puppy to come back to you when it's time? And that's why meditation is such a wonderful practice. And meditation often looks very different than how people think it should, quote unquote. I get so many people who come to me saying, oh, I've tried meditation and I'm doing it wrong. And the only reason I feel like they're doing it wrong is because someone told them there's a quote unquote right way to do it, which convenient enough was their way. But meditation can be painting, it can be drawing, it can be jogging, it could be wherever you're doing something and your mind stays focused on just what you want it to focus on. So, you know, whether it be granting your mind everything at once or deciding not to, whether it be while you're sitting meditating and there's an itch and you go, okay, I have the urge to scratch it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to wait till the bell rings and to signify the end of the meditation. And you realize that that was just the mind almost throwing a tantrum going, you've abandoned me. You're not giving me the attention that I want. You know, so a spoiled kid going, mom, 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 what? Nothing. I just want you to acknowledge that I'm here. And so it, 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 the first step is kind of just to almost take a step back and observe the mind and not identify with it and realize even if you have two opposing thoughts, you're not either one of those thoughts. You're the one sitting there watching them argue with one another. And it's just this beautiful re introducing yourself to yourself and figuring out where am I in all of this. So there are so many practices and we can talk about that just all day, but really the, the, the training the mind, grasping, it's, it's for, the first step would be getting to know the mind, figuring out how it works and then deciding, okay, like in, like training a puppy, what commands do I need to give it when I want it to come back and stay focused so that I don't spin into anxiety, thinking about what the future, what might go wrong and I don't sink into depression thinking about how things were. But how do I keep bringing the mind back to the present moment, which is all we've got? And I think it's very possible, but it takes practice, especially if we've spent 30, 40, 50 years not doing that and letting the mind run wherever it wants. Now, suddenly we're trying to train it. So it is possible, but it takes diligent effort. And, and that becomes being aware of the difference between feelings and emotions, being aware of, of when we're acting out and when we are... Um, just be remaining present if that makes sense there's just so there's so many ways it manifests but the first step is just to to, to look to, to lift up that rock and look under it and go who am i you know who am i if, if 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 not my job title if not my relationship status if not my age anything that's temporary like when i remove all of that what remains and we need to f define that and then have that be who shows up no matter what shows up at the grocery store, shows up in traffic, just be that. And life will give you many opportunities to show up. You know, if, if you want to be patient and understanding and compassionate, but you're you have road rage, 
well, you can make a determination to, to start being more peaceful on the road. And then somebody cuts you off. And let's say you do lose your cool and, and your focus because you've been doing it for so long. Don't worry. Just get back on that path because someone will cut you off again. You'll have another opportunity to try. Life is never going to stop testing you. It's just keep showing up, keep showing up. And I every day is, is that gift. Every opportunity, every relationship is an opportunity to grow if you see it as such. Yeah. Sort of segues into what you talk about. Sit happens. What do you mean by sit happens? So sitting, the difference in between the Zen practice of quote unquote meditation and what we typically think of meditation, oftentimes someone, let's say, asks you a question that's very difficult and you say, I'm going to meditate on that for a while. Meaning you go into your meditation with something to focus on, something, some end goal of, of something you want to figure out. Whereas in Zen, they don't, well, again, there's 800 different schools of Buddhism um, and multiple of just Zen tradition. So I can't speak on behalf of all of Buddhism. But where I studied, they don't even call it meditation. They just call it sitting. Meaning, and, and we don't even sit out facing everyone. We, you, we sit facing a blank wall. And the idea is to just sit with what comes up and allow it to come up, not redirect it. Just, just that wall that you're staring at becomes a mirror and it reflects back to you. The reason I say sit happens is because it, it's something you need to make happen. Meaning it, if you don't, I'm trying to equate it to any other kind of relationship, you're developing a relationship with yourself and you've got to carve out time for it. Uh, just like you would to any partner with whom you want to establish and, and cultivate a relationship, you're doing that with yourself. And so you need to carve out time to sit together. And that's what it's like, it makes it happen. And, and that will inevitably allow things to f blossom and, and reveal things that you otherwise would have not seen. Just like if you were to sit down across from the person with whom you were in a relationship and allow them to, to show you who they are, you will see such a beautiful being. We need to stop doing and start being, you know, we, we, and we're so busy doing, doing, doing. It's like, stop, just, just sit, which is so contradictory. I grew up with a dad who I was like, don't just stand there, do something, you know, or don't just sit there, do something. And, and Buddhism is like, don't just do something, sit there. It's the exact opposite, but a lot gets done. You know, you, it, it looks like you're not doing anything, but you're, you're growing. It's just internally ever so slowly, uh, but beautifully. Well, the most powerful thing you can do is to show up and respond to someone instead of sh showing, instead of reacting and, and allowing yourself the time to listen, also to add instead of subtract. So a lot of people want to go in there and, you know, add their two cents, but what is if you help someone multiply or subtract their own, like, the whole idea of, you can look at Bruce Lee, the analogy of the martial arts man, is literally be like water, meaning it's just an empty cup, an empty vessel, an empty container where he's not reacting. He's literally responding and using the energy that's coming at him to disarm the other person as well. And it's very similar to a spiritual person like yourself or someone that has a high level of understanding that you go there as an empty container, an empty vessel you to give space and give silence and and stay fluid you know because but that's how my teacher used the, the teaching of be like water he said because that which is rigid breaks so if you're holding on even if it's your beliefs and you're holding on to them like this that is actually a sign of the first thing you need to loosen your grip on you know it's just this idea that you're right it's the idea that you know something it's just letting go of all of that so any rigidity and, and be like water, fluid, being able to just navigate around and carve out. And water is very, very powerful. Um, it can carve out the Grand Canyon, you know? It just takes persistence, um, but not resistance, not, yeah, persistence, not resistance. It's it's a beautiful way to, to be in the world. Well, the best state of water is, you know, water moving and dancing either in the ocean, waves, rivers, streams, waterfalls anything but stagnant yes <laughs> i went to a waterfall recently and like a gobsmack literally just stood there in silence for you know quite a bit of time and just the the awesome power 
of water in motion is uh, is such an amazing analogy as well. But yeah, there's so much to unpack through here. But talk to a little bit about where they can find you on the podcast. So you've got a podcast out there as well with a lot of content out there. Where can people find your message on the podcast? Yeah, so the podcast is the Buddhist Bootcamp podcast. Um, every episode, is, it's less than 10 minutes. Uh, the idea, much like in the book, is for people to to think for themselves. You know, So I offer food for thought like i just plant the seed and and even though the episode ends the idea is for it to stay with you for the rest of the day the week the month maybe even for the rest of your life just this no new idea new perspective something to think about because we don't pause enough to think about these things so there's the buddhist bootcamp podcast there's the book there's uh, faithfully religionless which is more of a memoir and conversational uh there's youtube there's it i'm trying to meet people where they are so if they're on facebook or instagram it's not about forcing anyone to do anything. And that's what I love about the social media platforms is you're not shoving anything down anyone's throat. You're just making it available and those who want it will show up and those who don't will just scroll through. It's this really non... It's it's not very hostile. It's not, I mean, at least from my end. <laughs> it's a marketplace. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a marketplace where people go to the marketplace knowing that they're either going to be sold or buy something. And at the end of the day, the, the, the merchant there is just putting their goods up there. And if you like, you like. If you don't like, we'll move on. There's no no harm, no foul. Just keep walking. Exactly. Amen. Beautifully beautifully put. Exactly. So, Timber, thank you very much for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. To my audience out there, check out your stuff. Great website, great books, and a great podcast as well. Forward to having you want to get in the future when your next book comes out, and we can unpack that as well. So, again, thank you very much for, for being a guest. Namaste. Thank you. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste.